Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible Church Sunday School. Whether we're old or whether we're young or whether we're young or whether we're old, there are things that concern us and sometimes we get afraid. Why do we get afraid? Jesus is near. Would you stand with me if you're able and sing together, How Can I Fear? Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence with us this morning and always. We thank you, Father, that we don't need to worry. You can give us that peace that passes all understanding if we lean upon you, look to you, and let you have your way in our lives. Thank you for this time together in your house. Father, time to come apart from the world and just to focus on fellowshipping with one another to uh, fellowship and worship you and study your word together father just pray that uh, it would be a beneficial time for each one of us that you would uh, help us to evaluate our lives and our stand with you our walk with you and that it might grow deeper and richer and fuller in the days ahead of us this week. May you be honored and glorified this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, except for Dennis and Deb in their class and verse. do 
has an effect on everybody else, doesn't it? It's hard to remember that sometimes. How about our teens? Thank you, teens. How about the adults? Thessalonians 5, 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to ask all the classes to stand together. Let's sing that first verse of How Can I Fear together as our classes are dismissed. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Anyone need any handouts? Anyone that didn't have those? Bill? Anybody else on this side? While we're here? Okay. You're welcome. Be there in a sec, Chris. Well, this morning, we're going to be in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. So we're now going to be considering this was the second letter that the Apostle Paul has written to the church in Thessalonica. There were still some problems of some things that they weren't certain about. So there were three kind of main points that the Apostle Paul wanted to, uh, to stress to the Thessalonians in the second letter. And the, the one that we'll primarily work with today, the one that we'll primarily look at is going to deal with Paul trying to encourage them in the face of intense persecution that has uh, set in upon this church. Uh, I think we can assume probably because Paul addresses what the, uh, what the future outcome is going to be for those who persecute believers, it's probably a safe bet to say that the Thessalonians were wondering, what's going to happen? Why are the persecutors getting away with this evil that they're uh, perpetrating on us? And so Paul's going to take some time to address that. You know, persecution is something that the church has dealt with ever since the Lord was here, and he warned that it was something that we were going to face. Today, it's no different. Um, as we look around the world, it's kind of appropriate, I think, that we're today, this is, uh, we're going to be talking about persecution. Next Sunday is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So help us get in the mindset of what our brothers and sisters are going through. According to Open Doors, that's a ministry that was founded by Brother Andrew. I don't know how many of you have heard of Brother Andrew. He was uh, God's smuggler, smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain back in the uh, 60s, I believe, and, and 70s. Well, anyway, uh, according to Open Doors, they track a lot of statistics about the persecuted church. 4,998 Christians, as far as we know, were murdered last year. Um, that's just the ones that we know about. 
14,766 churches or Christian properties were either attacked, burned, or shut down. Shutting down is something that's been happening very significantly in uh, communist China. They've been finding excuses just to shut these properties down, bulldoze the properties, and away they go. 4,125 Christians were detained last year for their faith, whatever that means, imprisoned, um, house arrest, whatever you want to consider that. If you take the 50 worst nations in the world for persecution, and that's places where persecution is either very high to extreme, that encompasses 317 million Christians. 317 million, I mean, you're talking about approaching the entire population of the United States. Um, an interesting, so when you break that down into statistics, that means that one in seven Christians worldwide are facing very high to extreme persecution. If you break, go to the continent of Africa, you find that it's one in five Christians is facing that level of persecution. And in Asia, it's two out of every five are facing that kind of persecution. So this is not going away. It's something even that we're starting to feel the, the effects of here in the United States, in the West. As, as our society continues to become more secular, as we see forces that are caving into woke idea, ideas and woke ideology being pushed by our corrupt media, our corrupt universities, so many other places that are pushing this, we're starting to see it come to America. According to Samaritan's Purse, uh, this was last year, Oregon, small bakery forced to shut down because their big, biblical beliefs did not allow them to make a cake for a lesbian couple. In Indiana, a small town pizzeria owned by a Christian family closed its doors after receiving death and firebombing threats after the owner had said in a TV interview that he would not want to cater a gay wedding because it would conflict with his faith. It's not just a pressure that's brought by society. We even see the courts and the government starting to move in. New Mexico, state Supreme Court ruled that a photographer could not refuse to shoot gay ceremonies. Washington State, Flora sued by government because she could not in good conscience create custom arrangements for a same-sex ceremony. These kind of things go on and on that we're hearing about in our own culture. People lose their jobs because of, of stances that they take um, that are going against what the secular society people to embrace. So persecution is occurring. We're finding church shootings. Uh, things are happening where uh, Christians in the United States and the West find themselves the target of persecution. So we need to think about that. You know, it's probably very uh, normal for us that we, we hear about stories of people getting away with evil. We hear about criminals that commit criminal acts and get away with it. We think about these persecutors that are attacking our brothers and sisters, and it seems like in many instances, they're flat out getting away with doing that type of persecution. I think in the West, we've always had this idea of justice, and I think that we might want it so badly. We sometimes think that we can correct every injustice, but we have to remember the world is an unfair place, right? And it's filled with a lot of unjust people. And so there's no way that we're ever going to see that done in our power. But what we're gonna to see today is that God is always just and he is going to bring about his justice in the end. God is going to punish the persecutors. He is gonna punish unbelievers. He's gonna give rest and reward to believers and that's gonna help us focus on what we really should be doing. And that's telling the lost and those who are doing the persecuting or who are in unbelief about the Lord so that they don't suffer the justice and judgment that's gonna be theirs if they don't turn to Christ. So that's kind of in a, a sum how we're going to take a look at our lesson here today. Let me dry out here. The first point that we'd like to make out of this uh, first chapter is the idea that God enables believers in trials. Let's go ahead and read the first four verses of 2 Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. We, we see this often in Paul's epistles, right? He often um, starts off with this very typical greeting, this idea of grace and peace. I think we can sometimes kind of just gloss over it. We've read it so often, we hear it so often. It's just kind of like saying, you know, dear so-and-so in a letter. You, you're not thinking about it. But the, the Thessalonians, as Paul's stressing, are recipients of God's grace and peace. And we are as well. We should never stop thinking about grace and how important it is. Paul is telling the Thessalonians how important it is in their ability to withstand what's happening to them. Grace, that's that unmerited favor, or I, I kind of like God's riches at Christ's expense. It's, it's mankind getting exactly the opposite of what we really deserve. And I mean, that should, that should take our whole lives and change our focus when we understand what God has done for us in that sense. And this idea about peace, you see that all the time as well in Paul's epistles. But you know, it's, simp it's a lot more than simply being at rest or being unstressed. Paul's not just praying for them to you know, be chilled out. This kind of peace that he's talking about, this is the peace that means an end to the hostility that had existed between us as sinners and God. And so there's been a cessation of that hostility that's a, that's a beautiful thing that uh, the Lord has done for us. We think about that verse in Romans 5.1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That peace, because we are no longer at war, and that's what the Thessalonians have to understand, and it's very helpful for them in this circumstance. John MacArthur, um, and I used some of his stuff, obviously, in the uh, preparation for this lesson, um, he points out that there's a, a real kind of loving and intimate tone in this letter. And it's not one that you typically see, he says, in a lot of other of the epistles. Um, it's especially um, indicated here in Thessalonians. You know, in a lot of those other letters, if you talk about the, the epistles to Corinth, he had a lot of, he had to kind of come down hard on them. And in some of the other epistles, what he has to do is he's, he's fighting to establish his authority as an apostle because their people are questioning his authority or questioning his teaching. But in this book, it's not about apostolic authority that he's trying to establish. It's loving intimacy and encouragement that he's trying to give this, this church that's uh, standing up so strongly. This isn't a Corinthian church. It's not a Laodicean church that he wants to, you know, like the Lord would spew out of his mouth. This is a church, as MacArthur says, that uh, Paul is actually proud of, and we're gonna see that as we work through the rest of this lesson. In verse three there, you see that uh, the word we ought. We ought always to give thanks. That phrase in truth, I mean, when you hear the word ought, it's not exactly the way it's in, in, in the Greek. It's not maybe we will and maybe we won't, or yeah, we really ought to pray for you. It's not that. In the Greek, the word for ought, it's an, the idea of being compelled. The Apostle Paul is saying, I am under compulsion. I am driven. I'm obligated to bring, uh, to bring you up before the Lord because, because he loves them and because he wants to see their great success. So Paul is obligated to give thanks to the God for the Thessalonians' growth in faith and love. Uh, when you see that right there in verse three, do you notice who gets the credit? I'm sorry, I heard it. Yeah, God alone, isn't it? You know, there, he's not, he's not, he's not uh, giving the Thessalonians the credit for that. He's really giving that credit to the Lord directly. Um, God's working in the Thessalonians, and Paul understands that, and they're doing this under persecution, which is uh, very note noteworthy on their part. So we see that it's God that gives grace for the growth and the love that's going to occur. You know, the, the fact that their love is increasing, that's actually a direct answer to Paul's prayer back in 1 Thessalonians 3.12. He had prayed that their love would be increasing for one another. And now here all of a sudden, he's saying it's happening. We can see it. 
Um, he said, he asked, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. And here, just a few months later, he's able to say, we see it, we're hearing about it, it's true. That word that you see also in verse um, three, where he talks about that uh, their love, their faith is growing abundantly. That idea of growing abundantly is really so that it's, it's beyond measure. It's beyond what could routinely be expected. It's um, very, very, very powerful. I came across this uh, from one commentator. I thought this was good. He wrote, it is hard for faith to grow without difficulty, without persecution or affliction or trouble or trials or stress because God has no opportunity to draw you to himself and display his love and mercy and power. So the true believer accepts all of this and finds his trust in God growing. I don't know about you. Actually, I think I do. If I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have found your faith growing and your trust in God growing after you've faced a, a challenge in life? Maybe it was something interpersonal. Maybe it was a, a disease or an illness, the loss of a loved one. Those are the times when you really find that your faith grows. So we need that. We need that to, uh, to really expand ourselves in the Christian life. In verse four, you know, I mentioned that MacArthur had the idea that this was a church to be proud of. We see it right here in verse four, don't we? Because of their perseverance under persecution, Paul is holding them up to the other churches that he's, he's dealing with. He's saying, look at this church. Look at the example that they are. He's not boasting about them being perfect Christians. What he's boasting about is the fact that they've submitted themselves to God, right? They've submitted themselves to God, and then he in turn is working powerfully in that church and bringing them through things. You know, God will work in us as believers, but that doesn't mean we just stand still and wait for God to act, right? We're supposed to, by faith, we're supposed to trust God and move forward in his strength. He's gonna work as we work for him. Paul boasts of these uh, Thessalonians to other churches for that very reason, because they submitted themselves to God and they were enduring persecution for the faith. And that's kind of an amazing thing to think about. Um, that brings us to our first question on the handout. You know, when you're bragged about, if you're not careful, what could happen? Pride could start to creep in, right? How should the Thessalonians have responded to Paul's boasting about them in an ideal sense? What do you think, Roger? Yes. Yeah, you could have you could respond one of two ways. In the flesh, it could be a puffing out of the chest, and yeah, we really did you know, high five in one another, saying, "Look at the Apostle Paul thinks we're pretty good stuff." Or you can be as Roger says, as they should be, and I think that they probably were. They were humble. They were recognizing that it was God enabling them to to do this, to accomplish this. Phyllis. I agree. I think that's spot on, Phyllis. I, I, I think that it had to have been a huge encouragement considering the strain that they were under from the persecution that they were facing. Um, there's no doubt that that had to have been such an encouragement to them. Richard, did you have another thought? It's remarkable maturity. I mean, I mean, we see they're confused about a lot of things. I mean, they're they're fearful that they've missed. You know, the, the day of the Lord has occurred, and they're still there. They've got some real concerns, obviously. 
But think how young they are as a church. How young they are, and that they can, that the Apostle Paul can make this kind of boast about them. That's really, it, it's amazing, and it's a great encouragement. On the other flip side of that then, our next question, what might be some indicators that believers are serving God out of pride rather than humble dependence on God? Mike? I, th I think that's probably the first and foremost one. Well, why thank you? you know, didn't I do well, Roger? Yeah, I, th I think that that would be a, a great a great danger for people who have pride. They may look at the situation and say, well, look, I did it. Or if, if it's a situation just the opposite, if they see someone else getting credit and they don't get it and they're, they're burning about that, that could be another issue. Pastor? We're, we're human. I mean, I just like, why do any of us that teach Sunday school fret about it? I mean, we don't, we, we want to effectively bless and exhort our brothers and sisters with the word of God, but I sure don't want to fail doing it. And so we can start worrying about what people think. You know, I think it's an easy thing to slip into. It's a, why, probably why I get nervous and get dry mouth the way I do. So Charlene. I, we hear that sometimes from some churches, right? And yeah, I would I would worry about that for them, that that's becoming more of a focus on what they're accomplishing rather than what God's accomplished. So yeah, those are all, all dangers if people don't submit to a serving God out of a humble heart. So we know that we know that the Thessalonians' persecution and trials were apparently numerous because this is what Paul makes one of his his main focuses in in Second Thessalonians. But in spite of them all, they keep standing strong, you know, and they're able to uh, remain stable in their faith. So we know that God enables believers in trials. That's a that's a great thing. Second point that we'll want to talk about here from this passage is that God justly judges all people. That idea that we came in in our introduction talking about, are they ever going to pay for what they've done? Are the persecutors going to get what they have coming? Well, yes, they are. Let's read 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, 5 through 9. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So we see right off uh, the get-go here in verse 5, and this is kind of maybe a, a hard thing for somebody to grasp. I would think especially for a new believer to grasp. The endurance of their persecution is proving that God judges righteously or justly. It, put yourself in the, in the shoes of a new believer and it's like, wait a minute. I'm suffering, I'm, I'm being persecuted, I'm being chased, I, I got fired from my job. And this is evidence that God is just? If we don't see the whole thing, I think it would be simple, easy for somebody to fall into that trap. It may almost seem like backwards thinking. But their suffering, as Paul's gonna point out, it's definitely not a sign of God's abandonment, it is just the opposite. 
the fact that they have been placed under the persecution and they're able to endure it is the evidence that God is just, that he's gonna give them the ability and the power to get through that. So that proves the fact that God empowers them to put up with that persecution. That's what proves that God's working powerfully in their lives. Their faith, while they're being persecuted all that time, that also proves the fact that they're saved because they don't fall away. So therefore, God considered them worthy of his kingdom. And you always think about the different things that people think about that may play into your salvation. Their suffering didn't do anything to contribute to their salvation, right? But what it does is it does provide evidence that they were saved, the fact that they stood up through it. You know, Paul wrote to the Philippians in uh, Philippians 1.29. He said, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And we're gonna see that that theme is, is all over the New Testament, that idea that we're going to suffer for it. There's nowhere here where I see prosperity gospel coming into play. That is, that is certainly not the, uh, the evidence that the New Testament gives us. And I, I marvel to see the success that that movement has in drawing the droves to themselves. But it's certainly a lie. In Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, you know, the Lord Jesus himself is the one who lays out what's going to happen to believers. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So it's, it's to be welcomed. It takes faith and it's gonna take maturity for a believer to have that. But the Thessalonians, as young as they are in the faith, they've got that kind of strength for that. To suffer for Christ means that a believer is actually living for Christ. That's, that's a proof. And to live for Christ is always the believer's best life, right? Amen, that's, that's a fact. So the way of suffering for Christ's sake, it's a privilege and it's a blessing for the believer. James 1 tells us to count it all joy when facing trials, right? That the testing of our faith perfects us. One commentary puts it like this. The more trouble and trial you go through, the more you're driven to God. The more you're driven to God, the better you know him the better you know him, the more you trust him. And that's the cycle that takes and builds a believer in faith. I like what John MacArthur stated in one of his sermons that I listened to on this passage. He said this, persecution will always destroy false faith. Persecution will always destroy false faith. So then MacArthur references Matthew 13, 21 the parable of the sower, right? And he says, it's like the seed that's thrown on the rocky ground. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Persecution destroys false faith. But persecution never, ever destroys true faith. Persecution produces a pure church. And so that's what we see happening. You know, I, I think about this as I was studying for the lesson. I've lived my life in such comfort, you know, living in America, in the West. And sometimes I think, probably like most of us, it's hard to imagine that suffering is a good thing. We, we avoid it at all costs, whether it's physical suffering or financial suffering. We do whatever we can you know, to try to overcome those things. In terms of the persecuted church, I know I often find when I'm praying about the persecuted church, I often find myself saying, Lord, please relieve them of the persecution. You know, please you know, relieve their suffering. But you know what's ironic about it? 
when, when you read the stories, like from Voice of the Martyrs and, and Open Doors and some of these other organizations, you find that the persecuted brothers and sisters are not asking to be relieved from their persecution. They're asking for prayer. They're asking for prayer to be strong, for their faith to, to be strong. They're praying about the opportunity to witness to lost loved ones who, who are perhaps the very persecutors who are after them, honor killings in the Muslim world and all of that kind of thing. That's what they desire. They don't ask to be removed from the suffering so often. And as I read those stories, it's like you can see and sense their faith, how strong, how, how incredibly vibrant it is. And that's all in the face of this persecution. And, and you see that they're growing strong just by the maturity of what they ask for, for prayer. It's just amazing. It, just, it, I, it, ama it always amazes me. It humbles me um, to no end. It's like I don't know what suffering really is, I think, sometimes. Don? Don? Faith that can be tested is a faith that can be trusted. Okay. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Okay. It's like metal that's not been hardened properly, right? It's not going to, Richard could tell us about that. You know, metal has to be properly prepared in order to be strong. It can be weak otherwise. I think that's that idea MacArthur's talking about, you know, um, a false faith is always going to be destroyed by persecution. You can't uh, stand for it. Well, verse 6, it's kind of short there, and, uh, but it's very to the point. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. It's very simple, but there it is. Paul says they're going to be repaid. So God's justice and his judgment is going to, include the repaying of these persecutors for what they're doing. God always judges persecutors justly, and he's not going to allow their, their uh, evil to go unpunished. Turn to Psalm 37 for me, if you will. Psalm 37, we'll pick up in, in verse 9. Psalm 37, verse 9. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance, but the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. We can trust God to carry out his promises, and it's, it's a whole list of them right from one psalm. You know, we should never feel that we have the need to get revenge personally for anything. Romans 12, 19 tells us, right, that we should never avenge ourselves. Lord wrote through Paul, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God will fairly repay those who persecute believers. We can take that promise to the bank. It's going to happen. That next question I asked on the handout, I asked you to name Think about some biblical examples of God repaying persecutors with the same persecution they used on God's people. Richard? Yeah. 
the, the, basically, the whole story of Esther is kind of like uh, all of you that are plotting evil against the Jewish people get are going to get just what you wanted to give to the Jewish people. Yeah, I thought about that one. Nathan? Yes. Okay. Carrie? The lions were hungry at that point, weren't they? <laughs> Roger? That, that had the waters crash in on them. Pastor, do you have a hand? Oh, there, I, didn't, I didn't think of that one. Yeah, you're right. Al? Yes, all right. Plenty of, Don, go ahead. More, more promises from the Lord. We know he's, he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Gerald? You know, We've had plenty of examples. I think God gives us enough in Scripture to see where some of the people who are persecuted get to see God's justice meted out upon the persecutors right away in their lifetime. We may not always have that ability to do it, but we need to remember God's, God's timeline, his economy, different than ours. And so, but nonetheless... He never changes. He will, he will be just. He will carry out his punishment. We can depend on that, certainly. From Psalm 37, 20, that we just read, our next question. Given their future judgment, what should be our desire for those who persecute believers? It's that, it's that simple, to be saved. You know, it, it's, it's real easy sometimes in the flesh, if we let anger get the best of us, to get bitter and say, we want to see it, or we want it to be carried out. But when we stop and think about what awaits them, we, sh we shouldn't want anyone to have to face that. How much, how much more glory for God when those people turn from their wicked ways and they accept the Lord and live for him? It's, it's so much a better thing than revenge, which our revenge is never proper. You think about the Lord, all of his attributes are in perfect balance with one another. His holiness, his justice are perfectly balanced by his love and his mercy and all of these other things. He'll never make a mistake. He'll never act out of rash anger or emotion. We, on the other hand, not so much. Phyllis? Amazing, isn't it? I see other hands, Gerald. There's a good, there's our example right there, Richard. Praise him. Praise him for that. All right. Well, let's move on to verse 7 here. God justly rewards believers as well. 
the evil, the persecutors are going to get what they have coming. God is also just, though, in rewarding believers. We see that Paul comforts them with God's promise of relief and that there's going to be a time coming when uh, we're going to be reunited with one another and with Christ. What do you think, uh, the, the next question on your handout, what differences will we notice between Christ's rule and the rule of nations today? The reason he's talking about this is the idea that he's encouraging the Thessalonians, don't worry. When the Lord is revealed from heaven, we're gonna, you're going to be with him. You're going to be part of this. You're going to be part of the, the millennial kingdom, and we'll all be together forever with Christ. So in light of that, what do you think? What, 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 what are you going to notice about that rule? Al? Beautiful. Just as, there isn't going to be any more corruption, is there? You know, we talk, we talk about our own politics, and, and we know it's so far from perfect. We refer to the swamp, you know, to talk about the corruption that goes on. There's not going to be any of that when the Lord is in control. Mike? Richard? Total peace. Yeah, those are all, all wonderful things. He is going to rule justly. There's not going to be any more corruption. It's going to be very, very wonderful. In verse 7, notice that word there that we have. It's uh, that the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. In the Greek, that word for revealed is apocalypsis. Does that sound like any word in English? Apocalypse, right? Yes, apocalypsis. What that means, it's the unveiling. It's the uncovering or the revelation. You think about Jesus' first coming. He was veiled in his first coming. He was veiled in human flesh, veiled in his humanity. And, and almost no one understood who he really was. But that's not going to be the case in the Lord's second coming. It's going to be an instant unveiling. And as the the word says, you know, every eye is going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And the lost are going to know instantly. They're going to know instantly who he is and what has happened. And it's going to be a dire, sad, incredibly sad moment for them. So that's the apocalypse, the unveiling of Christ. Now, verses 8 and 9, we talk about God justly punishing Unbelievers. We're not just talking about persecutors here. Paul kind of wraps up what it's going to affect in everyone. He says, when the Lord does reveal himself from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of God. So he's going to take his vengeance. That word vengeance, or I, th I think you, maybe in the NASB it says tribulation, is that what you have there, Phyllis? You have retrib oh, I'm sorry, retribution and vengeance. You know, the root word for that is just, as in the word justice or justified. That's at the root of that vengeance and retribution. So understand, it's completely righteous judgment that's being carried out here. There is nothing unjust about it. These people who are going to be in that situation will have earned what they have coming. Righteous vengeance. Some people think that the final punishment for sin is going to be annihilation. They base that on the fact that we read here in verse 9 that they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. They theorize, well, if something is destroyed, it doesn't exist anymore, right? It's gone. But I think that most commentators and I think most Christians who can just read say there's no getting away from that first word that comes before destruction. It's eternal. Just as we find in many other places where eternal is used, either to talk about eternal life that's ongoing or eternal death, they are the same. There is not going to be any end sight for the people who are caught in that destruction. And it's also going to be away from the presence of the Lord. So it's going to be an ongoing destruction and th these people are going to understand fully. Just think about uh, Jesus' parable 
about the beggar Lazarus and the rich man. He knew, he knew very well what his condition was, and he knew well his separation from God. And I'm confident that the Lord wouldn't have used that parable at all if it wasn't an exact representation of what the end is going to look like. So we've covered two points. God enables believers in trials, and we can trust that God is justly going to judge all peoples. Well, finally, God enables believers to glorify Christ. Let's read those, pick up in verse 10 and read those last four verses. So we're, uh, the context here, they're going to be suffering punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 10, we see there, when we return with him at his revealing, we're going to glorify the Lord Jesus find that an amazing thing when I think about how imperfect I am. And, but his grace, his mercy, his, the future glorification that he's promised to believers, we are actually going to glorify him. We're also going to, you see there, we're going to be marveling at him. We're going to recognize his greatness. And Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians by telling them, guess what? You're going to be among those who worship Christ. You're going to be there and they are there because they believe the gospel that Paul had given them. The next question on your handout, I think about this. What do you think you will admire most about Jesus when you return with him to be a part of his kingdom? Where, is, where to start, right, Roger? Uh-huh. King of kings, absolute power. Anybody else? Richard. Yeah, that speaks of the power, I think, that Roger's talking about. Mike? yet he still is going to bring you with him. <laughs> Isn't that it's fantastic, Lena? Maybe the, our first thing just to fall down and stay there for a thousand years, <laughs> you know, before we could even have another thought, maybe. So holy. Charlene. Peace and calm. Bill. It's going to be a totally different package, isn't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look forward to that day. Yeah, I know. I, I was just thinking of his power. Power, you know, the power to slay all of his enemies, the power that created the entire universe, the billions of light years long that it is, and he has every atom of it under his control. What power? How can we fathom that? It's, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. Richard? It's going to be a marvelous, it's going to be a marvelous experience. And it's going to go on and on and on and on forever for us that believe. In verse 11, you know, we, we see here that Paul wants the Thessalonians' salvation. He wants them to, to motivate them to live worthy of their calling. I just, as I was thinking about that, studying it, it's like, do you realize how the, the Lord has put that theme in front of us so much here the last few months? 
that idea of walking worthy, walking worthy of the calling, of the, of the salvation that we have, it's like it, it struck me how often we've been seeing that and talking about it. And what a, what a great exhortation that is to me, that it should be to all of us, I think, to walk worthy. I tell you, it, it's what, it gives me the power to tell Satan to get behind me. It gives me the power to say no to sin. I am not going to let that control me because I don't serve that anymore. It's a, it's a great challenge, I find. Mary. You're, you're right. The evil is right in our face in a, in a big way now. We just need to... We need to be steady. We need to have the kind of faith that the Thessalonians were exhibiting. All right, verse 12, we see that the, Paul is telling the Thessalonians as they continue to walk in faith under their persecution, their lives and what they're doing are going to glorify the Lord Jesus' name. This promise of rest and relief from earth's trials and the fact that God's justice upon persecutors is going to occur is gonna motivate the Thessalonians to continue living faithfully until Christ's return. So what a beautiful, a beautiful promise uh, and encouragement that the Apostle Paul brings to them um, in this first chapter. You know, we have to remember this. God's justice lies ahead for all people. And that's, that means both the saved and the unsaved. And knowing what faces our unbelievers, that's what should be motivating us to be in prayer and to uh, look for those opportunities to share the gospel. There's people within our, each one of our individual spheres and lives who we are genuinely and appropriately terrified for because we know what's coming. We really need to take the best advantage we can to give people the truth from God's word so that they have an opportunity to accept him and know what we know the peace and the grace that's been extended to us. We often think about right ways to reach people with the Gospels, but do you ever think about what's a bad way? That last, second to the last question I asked, what might be some ineffective ways to share the Gospel? Anybody think of anything like that, Roger? Kind of, I don't remember the name. Is Westboro Baptist Church, is that the name? The ones that would show up at, Mil military funerals and you know use that as an opportunity to say you're going to you're going to burn in hell for the things you're doing probably not the best way to uh, create a tender heart or take advantage <laughs> of a tender heart i know i often think about this in, in some of the some of the little word conflicts i've been in with my family members over over the years when i want them to see things from a from god's perspective and they don't see it and i get frustrated I get angry, and I feel the blood coming up in me, and, and guess what? It's never done anything good for me to be able to, to reach them with the truth about God's grace and about the gospel, so we should be careful about that. Yeah, it doesn't witness well <laughs> at all. So when you think about lost people being forever separated from God, somebody's coming to your mind this morning, aren't they? So pray for those people. Pray for God to give you that opportunity, the grace, the words to use, to give them the truth. Phyllis? Yeah, badgering and arguing don't go well. So find a different way. Ask the Lord. He can help us to find a way to do that better in his grace more effectively. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We're so thankful that uh, through the Apostle Paul, you gave such encouraging words, words that uh, help us understand that even though things may seem to get tougher at times and, and persecution may come, but Lord, you've warned us about that. We've been warned. Help us to take those opportunities, understanding that you're growing us, you're growing our faith, you're growing our trust in you, and you're equipping us for a far better eternity. We know that you're just. Uh, we think about those around us who, who commit evil. We think about those who persecute the church. We think about those who simply 
discard the uh, thought of Jesus Christ and uh, discard the thought of you being on your sovereign throne. Soften hearts, Lord. Give us the opportunities to reach them with your truth. We thank you and ask this all in our precious Savior's name. Amen. You may be dismissed.